One of the things that I think surprised me is when we were doing the actual dissection of emu cadavers and we went back, um, we had the model of the system when we thought we, you know, well, there should be this uh, tendon linkage that goes all the way up through the leg to the femur. And so can we look at the knee anatomy and see evidence of these connections? It's incredibly complex, but you could actually follow the the connections between the connective tissues all the way up to the femur despite this complexity. So when you have that hypothesis, you can go and look for the essential elements that are there. It's true that they have um, this, this complex knee structure, and yet you can identify these linkages of connective tissue that connect all the way up to the femur as expected. Any model has simplifications, right? And this is the constant challenge of biology is uh, finding the right level of simplification for the question you're asking at that point in time. We do not want to rely on something which is not a, a point foot because something which is not a point foot is hard to model. If you have a, an actual foot, a segmented foot, mm. and you don't, you have a changing center of pressure. That's nothing so simple. Um, and if I have springs in my system and maybe dampers, physical dampers in my system, then again, I need to model those ones. They're going to react on their own. They have their own dynamics. And so they complicate my model-based approaches. And that's absolutely true. How bioinspired robots are being controlled, like literally what kind of controllers are implemented, they are quite different, right? So um, I, yeah, I agree totally with Monica. It's, it's a matter of... What is your task? Do you try to solve a technical problem as an engineer and you want to have a robot, a legged robot going up the stairs? Or do we want to try to, to find um, a model, an explanation, a proof of concept of what we observe in, in nature? And can we actually have this proof of concept in a hardware robot, which creates an often a bio-inspired robot? In this podcast, I'm sharing my passion and curiosity for soft robotics, where we share inspiring stories about the work we do and how we can push the limit. I am Mara Dweeney, and this is Soft Robotics Podcast. Support for this show comes from Science Robotics Journal. I really find Science Robotics to be a great resource for reliable and tangible research where we can really push the limit of the science we do in robotics. Great way to stay up to date with the published article is checking out the released monthly issue. All the links will be included in each episode description. We will also happen to have a regular conversation on the most published science robotic articles where also you can contribute with your question and thoughts about the research. Thanks, Science Robotics, for sponsoring Soft Robotics Podcast. First of all, uh, congratulations for the paper. I think it's very interesting, the BirdBot project. And I think it's, uh, maybe I wanted to ask uh, at the beginning for Monica, because I think the concept of an inspiration from ground uh, bird and how they use morphological intelligence, there's no sensing in actuation. I think that's very impressive when you speak about how we can design robots or soft robots for an expression like that. So maybe that question for Monica at the beginning. Can you tell us more about what's really fascinating about studying birds? Because there is many different uh, classification, if you can tell us. And what's actually interesting about the ground robots that can't fly? Um, I've been studying ground birds for, I think, about 20 years now. And I, what's particularly fascinating about birds to me is that they have a completely different evolutionary history and morphology from humans. We're most familiar with, you know, biomechanical models of human walking and running, right? But humans are a very unusual biped. We're the only, you know, species that walks with this completely upright posture. There's many different, many morphological differences in birds and they have a long evolutionary history of bipedality. So all living birds are bipeds um, and they come in a wide diversity of body size as well as, you know, locomotor ecology and behavior. 
But ground birds exhibit a form of locomotion that is thought to be quite similar to their ancestors among the theropod dinosaurs. Some of that, the, the overall architecture of the leg, um, the number of segments, and the muscle tendon systems that we see in running ground birds has a long evolutionary history that goes back to dinosaurs via theropod dinosaurs. And this, the diversity that we see in, in birds, I think reflects that some of the features are highly adaptive in that they allow robust and stable locomotion over a wide variety of terrains with relatively simple control. And my research in biomechanics has led to many hints about the specific, uh, how the specific morphological mechanisms allow for this intrinsic stability of and in mechanical, sort of intrinsic mechanical control, but it's very hard to directly test hypotheses about this in living animals because many times you can't make all of the direct measurements you want to make and you can't uh, remove the nervous system to demonstrate that it's fully, you know, mechanical control. And that's where the collaboration with engineers and building these robots is particularly powerful. It's that we, the, physic, the robot is a physical model of our understanding of how the bird system operates. And it's of course more simplified than we see in living birds, but it very nicely demonstrates the overall uh, function of the, the lower limb and the function of these tendon networks in providing intrinsic stability and elastic energy cycling for economical control with very um, simple uh, mechanisms to allow stance swing transitions without a lot of sensing feedback. Mm -hmm. What I really like was project using robots to understand what's actually happening in the mechanism. That's really, really impressive. Maybe I want to ask Alexandra in that case. I think you have this great experience in designing legged robots, but I want to ask you across uh, the project you have been doing many years now, um, how do you think about physical intelligence? Because clearly here you have going for concept how we can demonstrate more physical intelligence in the design. Okay, there's some, what is it missing in this, uh, the design of legged robot locomotion? And yeah, if you can tell us more what's interesting about the design to get for physical intelligence and just let's reduce sensing and actuation. Yeah, this is an this is a super uh, interesting question, as in, um, it really drives much of the research of the entire field, right? Um, the I think physical intelligence allows to extend um, what is currently in the in what we control in, in robots directly. So often we, uh, in a legged robot, we want to have exactly the amount of torque and displacement in the joint which we command, and um, we as an engineer you will build the system accordingly. Um, but what you don't control is the environment, and what you don't control is noise in the system. What you don't control are deflections, which are sometimes inherent coming from aging of the of the parts. And all of these unknowns can be captured if you have a design which can 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 react or can compensate in one or the other way for that. So I think physical intelligence or morphological computation, there, there are many names, I think, behind that. Um, it allows you to embed some of the functions into mechanics. And then from that, and we see this in biology, in fact, um, you, you, this, these, these components can react often much faster or they can be smaller and they can have higher pow power outputs um, or they, they are inert to communication delay. So there, there are many advantages and there are many different concepts and, and mechanisms which have been found over the many last years and um, we, we can draw quite many out of the box nowadays and we can input them into robots yeah mm -hmm. maybe i want to ask you again because i think in the in the field for robotics maybe soft robotics the idea that let's go for reduced sensing and computation and, and actuation and in this project i think it's very very interesting to exhibit that do you think this is really sufficient monic thing that this is just maybe simplified representation what's actually happening in the locomotion for birds that cannot fly. Do you think this is sufficient? Because you already demonstrated if there's obstacle, they can really, there is no delay to adapt. But do you think, generally speaking, that could really just say, let's 
reduced completely sensing and actuation of robotics. So that's something specific here. Um, yeah, so I, I, I would not, I, I'm definitely do, would not say that um, it's sufficient like to have the the bird butt star clutch like design, right? So that is a what what I consider, and I think also Monica as a base function of this leg. So it allows to to produce a large range of locomotion patterns and and robust engagement and disengagement, and so we produce leg forces and all of that. And so it's it's basically covering. I don't know if you have 100%, maybe it covers like the 70, 80% of the basic leg function, but it does that in a, with, with a mechanism. It's, it's a not, not a controlled system. It's a mechanism which engages, um, through, there's still a feed forward control part behind that, right? And, um, so it's, 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 it's clearly not something which you want to rely on completely if you want to have a robust, um, three dimensionally running animal or robot and you need to accelerate and you need to decelerate or if you need to hop around and if you need to be adaptive to all of these points or if you need to react right so if you as a bird if you see a predator you need to run away you can't you cannot only rely maybe on one set of muscles and that's what we see right so you don't just look at one extensive set of muscle you have many actuators inserting into many joints and the the function what we describe is the, the major function for which is one function in, in legged locomotion, you need to carry your body, right? So you want to carry your body. And so, well, yeah, you can put a parallel leg spring um, into, 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 into the robot and also uh, something like this is it's possible, at least um, in, in the bird. But, and you need to take that spring out of the system for, for swing phase, but it's not the only function of legged locomotion, right? So it's not only about carrying, you also need to hop. And so all of the examples I gave before and for those ones, you definitely, absolutely definitely want to have control. You want to have learning. You want to, again, you, you, your system changes, right? So you're aging, um, the animals are aging, um, or you're loaded, you, you carry a backpack or, um, you, you're, you're sitting on a horse. I don't know, whatever it is, or you're, like you, you're, you're eating, your, your belly gets full. And so all of that has to be absolutely captured by, uh, reflex systems by sensor uh, feedback by by mo like close to control like animals mo robots whatever you want to talk about yeah could I just add to that before we move on I think one of the the nice things about having this um, mechanical control element is that it's specifically um, taking care of those elements that have to occur very rapidly so there's unexpected changes in the ground contact conditions and the intrinsic mechanisms in this robot allow those uh, transitions between stance and swing and swing and stance. Those, those it, transitions are very important to maintain stable dynamics. The intrinsic mechanics handles that part, which happens on a very rapid time scale. And this allows the control to be applied on longer time scales. So to regulate foot positioning from step to step for balance. And while we haven't implemented more complex control in the robot, we do, you know, we do think that you could then layer on these to get even more um, agile and robust control mechanisms, right? By combining the intrinsic mechanical control with feedback control. And we do see lots of evidence that this is in fact what, what animals do, right? They do, they have, substantial transmission delays in the nervous system. So in when they're running rapidly, the fastest response time is a large fraction of the stride cycle. So they can't actually implement feedback control immediately. They have to rely on the intrinsic mechanical response, uh, you know, allowing for to, to, to keep the performance within a certain range before the feedback can then come into play. Maybe I want to ask you, uh, since you have been working for now more than 20 years, when you look to the ground birds, there is something maybe very interesting when you s compare with other species. And especially if we speak about the flying one and not flying, do you think having flying capabilities would affect locomotion? Because I think it's very interesting that they can stand even they're sleeping and there's no energy consumed. And that's fascinating. How is this happening? Can you break it down in detail from an inspiration? When you try to study and understand, clearly this project is seeing the, the robot try to explain, but when you try to model, do you 
what is the most significant part on the animal or the bird here, the ground bird, to understand what is actually happening here? I think from my perspective, understanding two elements is really essential. One is the geometry of the scuttle lever systems and understanding how um, the, the muscle tendon systems are acting at each of the joints. This, the, the careful uh, gearing of the different joints in the limb is how you fine tune the motion that you get upon loading of that leg. And then the other element that's really critical is the, um, the tendon network that is a multi-articular tendon network that is carefully designed to then um, transfer energy among the joints in a way that allows for the limb to be stiff and store and return elastic energy during stance, but to be rapidly shifted through this uh, bistable uh, tendon acting at a bistable joint in the lower leg to rapidly shift into a flexed position, which then makes the whole limb slack and very easy to flex for the swing phase. So it's the combination of the geometry of the skeletal system and the action of these multi-articular multi tendon networks on those joints in the system. Yeah, so, so I will mostly repeat what Monica is saying on this one, right? Um, but uh, yeah, really the, 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 the individual task that we needed to tackle was um, in the animal, you have segments, so bone segments, and you got uh, patella and other sesamoid bones, which act as the lever arm for your muscle tendons onto the joint, so that you individually produce torque in each of the joints. So, but uh, we know in birds, you have multiple leg joints, and you want to coordinate really how much torque is being um, induced in each of those joints. And so the, the, the basic idea was initially to say, to have one common tendon, so basically one mechanical coupling, which really um, induces by it, because it's a tendon, it's a it's a serious element. It has force; it's equal force everywhere. Um, that means we want to induce, but we want to induce different amounts of torque for each of those joints because each of the joints has a different distance. So here, what I'm painting a little bit is the geometry, um, which is which we clearly reduced in in the robot. So we we made it much more simple. Um, but we, we had to understand that in the animal, you can have still the representing components, the parts, as in bones, muscle tendons, um, uh, the, the, the lever arms of the, of the tendons. And we, we needed to have this transfer into a simple math um, presentation to eventually solve it. Because that was the, the other part. If you, if you don't assume that simpli simplification, and we, we try, I tried that before, um, I actually found it was very hard to solve if you, uh, if, uh, without the simplification. So uh, once we simplified it into the robotics uh, setup and saying, okay, we're using linearized cam mechanisms, we're using um, a pantograph leg structure as the base structure underneath, then we can create a single tendon network which produces a programmed, a hardware programmed amount of joint torque um, for each of those joints. So this was this, this first, this, this muscle tendon network to have this transfer. So that, that was very important for us to understand. And the second part is um, we want to have this model and this individual, this the single muscle uh, or spring tendon network now, and we want to switch it on and off, right? So we want to have this bistable um, behavior this, the, from the outside. And really they're looking at the bird and seeing that um, those most distal joints, the toe joints in, in the bird, that they would uh, flex and extend so much that we could use that action, that, that motion, to if we replicate it in the robot, and we could uh, therefore see how much tendon gets loose or not, um, that we could use it actually to switch off and on the uh, the more proximal network. That was the the second part which really was needed to to put those and put those two things together. And there were other smaller items like tendon slack and so on, which we also wanted to understand, and uh, it was really necessary to. It was really helpful to actually go back also to the bird and um, with Monica and really look again and say, okay, we, we think there should be something. And um, so it's, it's, a, it's a big puzzle. It was a big puzzle, in fact. Yeah, maybe I want to ask you here again, uh, both of you, there's something when you try to come up with understanding what's actually happening, if there's something, maybe Monica or you, this is really surprising or maybe not really straightforward, this is surprising or not really explicable. Do you have this kind of discussion with maybe confusing to explain what is happening in this locomotion or 
what is really, since you said simplified, do you think there's extra stuff needed to embed it in the robot to capture what you see or explain it? In case you want to think, I have one point. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so, go so, ahead. So, yeah, so the uh, what I just explained, right? So we simplified from um, bone and 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 patella and sesamoid structures into this uh, into a tendon network, which is comparably easy to calculate. Uh, in fact, you can you can draw almost the the mechanical conclusion of that on a piece of paper, and you can geometrically solve it. Really, it's 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 that it can be that simple if you look close enough. Um, but what still remains is the complexity in the animal, right? So we know that. The animal does not have single hinge joints, but these hinge joints, they have a rotating, like the, the center of rotation is shifting in between two bone surfaces, right? The articulation is not producing a hinge joint motion. And the same goes for the patella motions um, or the sesamoid motions. Right? They're not perfectly acting as cams, but they're highly nonlinear. And this has been documented many, uh, many times before. And that each of those instances, you have multiple times for the entire leg. And we simplify that and we said, well, we linearize everything, but um, what is not straightforward is now to go back and, and if you would ever want to try to see if these multiple nonlinearities might add up or, or kind of outweigh each other to become linear again. So I think that that is something where I'm right now, I'm curious about it. Yeah, understanding the complexity of the biological anatomy is it is a constant challenge. And one of the things that I think surprised me is when we were doing the actual dissection of emu cadavers and we went back, um, we had the model of the system when we thought we, you know, well, there should be this uh, tendon linkage that goes all the way up through the leg to the femur. And so can we look at the knee anatomy and see evidence of these connections? It's incredibly complex, but you could actually follow the the connections between the connective tissues all the way up to the femur despite this complexity. So when you have that hypothesis, you can go and look for the essential elements that are there. It's true that they have um, this, this complex knee structure, and yet you can identify these linkages of connective tissue that connect all the way up to the femur as expected. And many of the simplifications that we see even when people try to build fully anatomically correct musculoskeletal models of the emu ostrich, they're still making simplifications in how they model the muscle systems and the origins and insertions. So we were actually surprised by the knee anatomy because we had these pictures that are based on the anatomical studies and they too had oversimplified it. So based on those anatomical studies, we didn't think that the connective tissue connections that were needed were necessarily there, but when we looked in the real animal, they were there. So any model has simplifications, right? And this is the constant challenge of biology is um, finding the right level of simplification for the question you're asking at that point in time. And I think we do have a reasonable level of abstraction for understanding this whole limb function and the, you know, connections between the joints and the transfer of energy between the joints, but there's still a lot to be understood about the complexity of joint function in humans as well as animals across the board. Maybe I want to ask here about intelligence and design from two perspectives from your side and Alexander, but maybe you first, when you look how evolution can come up with such design like that in the, in the ground bird, for example, and also transformation from dinosaur to flying bird. How is this happening? When you, because now we speak about design. Eventually, in robotics, we try to design what's morphology, what is really the size, etc. When you try to look how evolution can come with this transformation from dinosaurs to bird, how is this happening? That's a big challenge to, to address that one. Um, a lot of many evolutionary biologists would cringe at using the word design in the context of mm. understanding animal uh, biomechanics and function because it is an evolved system. And for some people, design implies some intelligent, you know, creator, some intelligence designer. Uh, but evolution, we know, is a lot more complex and messy than that. Um, it's evolution is an optimizing process, right? It is not um, generating optimal solutions. 
many of the things, many of the features that we see in animals can be the result of millions and millions of years of evolutionary baggage, uh, structures that have been, were adaptive for function, uh, optimized for function in a different environment, in a different context. And they um, are still there because there's a lot of uh, developmental genetic inertia for changing these systems through natural selection. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't actually hurt, then it will still remain. So I think of evolution as an optimizing process, but it's not creating optimal solutions. It's creating good enough solutions, uh, depending on the specific, you know, um, selective pressures that are placed on the animals. So we always have to be careful about when we're trying to um, make arguments about a specific feature being adaptive. It may be that the complexity of the knee joint that we observe, for example, in birds is adaptive, or it may be that it's just kind of an evolutionary legacy joint that has gone through uh, lots of different shifts in s selective demands over many, many, like hundreds of millions of years. And some of those features could just be good enough for for what it does. Yeah, I, I just want to emphasize what Monica is, is saying is, is also based on, on the many papers in that field that are showing that the um, changes from dinosaurs to birds are really gradual. And you, you find so many samples where you can, let's say, we're working with legs, so um, leg posture, the crouchiness, the segmentation ratios, there are all of the intermediate uh, steps there are available in the, in the fossil record. And the papers are there. And so it changes, slight changes, like very small changes on the center of mass and then how the trunk shortened and, 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 and changed posture, how the, how the tail got shorter. So that absolutely supports in every way. This is a, it's an optimizing process. It takes small steps. It, there's no, there's never a sudden ginormous change where suddenly the head is at the end of the tail, right? So it just doesn't like, we, we see, mm. we see exactly how 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 evolution uh, is is being hypothesized and it's it's supported with every piece of evidence which which uh, which is not our like it's not my research but it's out there and you, you can read about it mm -hmm. and it's I'm I'm very I, I love reading and, and seeing seeing those examples. I just wanted to add in terms of the discussion of evolution. Um, evolution may be a messy process, but one of the great advantages to studying birds is that because of the diversity that you see among birds we can look for features that are convergent for specific functions among different lineages, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, not all ground running birds are directly related to each other, yet we do see convergence of similar features of elongated distal limbs and uh, lightened muscle mass in the distal limb and elaboration of tendons and greater multi-articular tendon connections among the birds specifically the birds that are most specialized for overground locomotion. So that's how we can use, we can, we can think about looking for clues in the evolutionary process by looking for convergence of similar solutions among diverse, unrelated animals. Maybe a quick question for you, Monica, here. Um, when you look to, you have been studied different species, but if you can give us comparative between the locomotion, which one may be more efficient since we deal with uncertain environment and we, for example, they have to escape predators or there is injury. If you have a holistic image, which one be more interesting for locomotion, human or animals or birds here? There's many, many stuff here to compare. Uh, you are expert here and you can tell us which one more efficient. Well, I think looking at animals that excel at a particular perf aspect of performance are always interesting, right? Ostriches are the fastest bipeds on earth. So they're, and they have a large body size, they can reach high speeds, they can go for long distances and, and they have more economical locomotion compared to humans. So I think that that's fascinating. But um, it's also intriguing to think about all of the small birds that are bipedal but live in three-dimensional arboreal environments and so they're having to go up and down the trunk of a tree uh, they're they're doing bipedal locomotion in three dimensions and this 
probably has some really fascinating features, um, adaptive features in the foot morphology, for example, to enable this that we haven't really fully analyzed yet. Maybe for Alexander, that's a question I will ask you. Then to have this rich experience in many robot design, this time when bird robot, for example, here, um, what really changed the new perspective of that design? Each time you try to to see what will be the end goal, but what really changed every time the perspective of the design process to come up with really intelligent design and how it's easy or complex if you can elaborate more. Okay, um, so 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 I had I had been building legged robots for uh, this project specifically, and um, I had I had been uh, implementing with a team uh, at EPFL in Alka Esports uh, Laboratory, um, leg designs, uh, which which we call um, parallel elastic leg design. So there's a springy leg, and the spring supports the leg function. And these 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 kind of legs work wonderfully. Um, like for example, with open loop control or with feed forward control, like central pattern generators, and they are robust. When you run them, they don't need uh, sensory feedback and such. Um, they have this one caveat that in uh, in swing phase, so in stance phase, they work wonderfully. But when you need to swing the leg, you need to work against that spring. And this is something when you build this as a robot, you you recognize this because you look at the power supply and the and you see well well my my hip motors they draw a certain amount of power, and the the motor which is responsible to flex the the leg or the knee joint and so to shorten the leg, that's massive amounts of power. And then you think about yeah that's because you have to work now against the spring and that's not what happens in the animal. And so specifically for this project. What changed the my perspective was joining Monica's group as a postdoc researcher, and uh, in that process, being able to look at um, at birds, bird legs, and uh, specifically at uh, the leg function in large birds in cadaver legs, also, right? So um, I saw that or I could see that uh, these legs have a mechanical coupling, which happens in certain of the joints. So when you move in a cadaver leg, if you move that leg, then the other leg joints also moving along, and that's a consequence, as I understood then, of the muscle tendons which are in there. And so even if this is an inactive system, there's no neural control, um, this coupling exists. And so what and th that happens especially in the distal leg, um, where we where we documented this also here for this bird bird project. Um, and so if you combine those two tasks now, if you recognize you you have a you have a parallel leg spring in the robot and that's a problem in swing phase, and on the other side you see the mechanical leg coupling you see the movement of the of the toe joints or the foot joints, and if you combine them correctly then um, you can basically get rid of that problem that you have a, a parallel leg spring and so yeah I think that that's mm -hmm. where where things got together. Mm -hmm. Maybe for Monica I don't know if you would like to add something here. I think um, I remember when we did this dissection on the on the emu cadaver. I, well, I wasn't there for all of them, but it's really um, fascinating to see when you're you know doing this hands on how you can uh, put the the foot into uh, the position that you know relates to the stance position, right, where it's flat against the ground. So if you're pushing it, you see you feel this direct resistance due to the passive loading. Um, of all of the tendons, but if you let the toe flex into the flex position that is comparable to the swing configuration, then everything is slack. And you can see physically the slacking of the tendons in the system. So it's uh, seeing that physical demonstration in, in the actual cadaver, so doing the actual dissection was very enlightening for us, I think. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Maybe a quick question for you here. Um... Since you mentioned evolution is messy and et cetera, but when we look to bioinspiration and a biometric, do you think, um, generally speaking here, if we speak at designing the robot, when you look to the ground birds here as example, do you think it's it's really optimum? Is something you think could be in robotics could be enhanced? I know it is not the case, but I want to ask you, do you have, have, you have this thought that maybe there's something could be enhanced in the robotics side. Um, so so, cl so clearly, what what we implemented here as a proof of concept 
can absolutely um, improve robotic leg designs. And not only that, this mechanism is, uh, should also be applicable for prosthesis and orthesis designs. Because what we have is we have a compliant leg in stance phase and that compliance switches off. This is, this is called a clutch um, in engineering. And this kind of clutch, clutching, many, many mechanical uh, solutions, engineering solutions for clutches had been proposed before our work. But these were engineering solutions and they often either involve control or actuators or uh, they're, they're, they're maybe more complicated and more heavy, um, they're complex. And here for the first time, we could actually on each of those points, um, bird box clutching leg design, the, the clutch is super lightweight. It's literally just a tendon um, and it involves barely a few, uh, the spring itself, which we have anyway. Um, it's absolutely robust as long as the toes are pointing into the right direction. The, this clutch will always engage. It will. It's fully scalable. We can make that mechanism, which we show here for a 29 centimeter hip height robot. We also show for a one meter 75 robot, like not robotic. It's just a leg what we built there. But the equations indicate we that there is no size limit really. So it's fully scalable, and. So the, the importance for, therefore, for robotics is now we have for the first time a, a leg clutching mechanism which auto engages, which is fully scalable. It costs no energy. It, there's no control needed. And that was just missing before. So um, we do expect a lot of changes to see in, in the robotics community based on that. I, I do expect it. Yeah. I think I would just reiterate what Alex already said. So I don't know if I have more to add there. Uh, I do think there is a kind of, in general, in robotics, there has been a tendency to have um, legs that have, you know, point feet, for example, very simplified feet. And perhaps this, this design highlights how effective design of a foot um, can actually facilitate um, better uh, mechanical control of, a, of the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to. Yeah, I would like to add to that since Alexander mentioned uh, robotics and and we had an episode with Hugh Hearn, and he was mentioning that the energy one of the problem consumption, and really this is impressive that the energy here is reduced. I think, yeah, it's really fascinating. Maybe I want to go again for the injury and redundancy. If there is this damage or failure in the bird, how they can adapt this mechanism? Maybe from biology, starting with you, Monica. For example, when I see bird, the the their imbalance, and, and I'm wondering if if they use morphological intelligence, how the sensing here could or reflexes, you can't elaborate more about the situation here. What is happening? Yeah, well, in the real bird robot, we don't have just uh, ligaments, right? They're the they're muscle tendon systems. So we have the mechanical linkages, but we also do have substantial muscle mass. Controlling the co-activation of those muscles and um, increasing that co-activation with, with feedback could be an important mechanism for preventing injury, right? But also all of biological tissues, tendon and bone, are adaptive over time. They will remodel based on the stresses actually experienced. So as long as there's not a catastrophic overload injury, these tissues will remodel. And for example, if there's consistently high loading, you know, you would see remodeling of the tendons to be stiffer. You would see remodeling of the bone to increase the cross-sectional area. So in the real biological systems, there would be adaptation over time to fine tune these structures to meet the typical loads experienced um, during locomotion and through reflex feedback to the muscles, you can then um, respond to sudden impacts to help absorb energy and help to minimize the, the risk of injury. So we see that the in mechanical control systems have to be acting in concert with the muscles that are there. The muscles would play a very critical role in preventing injury and responding to the, the unexpected perturbations. Yeah, so, so, so I like uh, Monica's um, explanation of, of considering, of course, again, the, the physical mechanism on one side, 
and then uh, sensory loop based or reflex uh, system to to um, have closed loop control in some some way. Um, and of course, what we also observe in the animal, there are several muscle tendons applying torque at joints and then over over multiple. So it's not just one. You often have multiple ones which are inserting and they're they're producing forces often during different parts of the of the of the load cycle, the gait cycle. But um, you could also have like um, muscles which are coming not exactly in that plane where the major muscle is acting, but maybe slightly off plane. And so this concept of having multiple actuators kind of doing the same job, we don't apply that in, in robots really. Um, because we, we have one function as an engineer, I have this one function and if that's the function and I don't need to add uh, in a redundant system but because legged robots really rely on a low body mass or and you want to you don't want to add more mass than necessary um to keep the legged robot as, as dynamic as possible but of course if you see the bird bot design and if you now imagine a future version of this robot which has a uh, sensory loops on top of that and it would have maybe a second actuator or in this case a third actuator um and you you add this redundancy this would help of course right so if the if something yeah i don't know the point is if you if you cut the tendon in that robot the robot will not work so easily yeah. <laughs> the redu redundancy wouldn't help it's just too simplified mm -hmm. i think um but yeah if you if you replicate what we see in animals if you would put many more actuators into the system you could clearly uh, achieve similar mm -hmm. redundancy effects mm -hmm. so maybe i want to ask you again if there is disagreement about the way of the design legged robots, maybe from Monica perspective, generally, if we try to see the explanation or hypothesis for locomotion and for you as well, maybe disagreement in the approach or explanation, generally speaking, in the field. I think there's some disagreement in the field about whether or not it's actually useful to use bio-inspired approaches or whether we should instead be designing based on fundamental principles and engineering design. And um, I think our robot is a, is a nice demonstration of how you can get innovative uh, features in leg design through uh, understanding the biological system. But I see BirdBot more as a physical model of the biological system that allowed us to test hypotheses about biological function. From my perspective as a biologist, that was the most fascinating part to me. So whether or not it is the right way to design robots, I don't really personally care because it is the right way to test a biological hypothesis. Um, <laughs> so maybe Alice can chime in on the, the controversies in the, in the robotics field a little more. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree with Monica. the The idea of uh, using bioinspired this uh, designs biomimicry um, is is being discussed. Uh, there are, I think, there are enough. There's enough evidence. There are enough papers out now that clearly show advantages of certain mechanisms. Mechanisms, and uh, the, these ones, uh, as a robotic designer, you, may, you have to make the choice if you want to incorporate them or not. Uh, we do see a strong tendency right now to have legged robots, which use few mechanical elasticities and they are instead um, directly actuated. Each of the joints is direct, directly actuated by a strong actuator, um, brushes, uh, DC motor control, and, and they're, they're very strong, they're very powerful. And the reason for that is that uh, over the last 10 years, five to 10 years, um, actuator development, like the mechatronic development has improved massively. Like we have literally a new generation of motors now available. Um, which was not not in that form and price tag available 10 years ago. Um, that involves the controller for that, that involves the uh, computational units to have a model-based control, that involves also sensors and sensing principles, and it involves batteries, so power supply. And on all of these um, uh, development uh, lines, there has been a lot of uh, advances have, have been made. And that combines into many people now saying, I want to have my legged robot directly controlled. Um, and they're, they're not very nice examples out there. Mm -hmm. And they work wonderfully. And we, including my group, we were also 
uh, we were um, participating on the development, the, the solo robot, which is an open source project out there. And we're using that and we will be using these kind of designs in future versions of BirdBot as well. Um, but that, that's basically, there's this, this one group of robotic leg designers that say, we want to have it as we want to be able to fully control. We do not want to rely on something which is not a, a point foot because something which is not a point foot is hard to model. If you have a, an actual foot, a segmented foot, mm. and you don't, you have a changing center of pressure. That's nothing so simple. Um, and if I have springs in my system and maybe dampers, physical dampers in my system, then again, I need to model those ones. They're going to react on their own. They have their own dynamics. And so they complicate my model-based approaches. And that's absolutely true. You need to have dedicated ways of controlling the more bio-inspired robots. And, and if you look at how bio-inspired robots are being controlled, like literally what kind of controllers are implemented, they are quite different, right? So um, I... Yeah, I agree totally with Monica. It's it's a matter of what is your task? Do you try to solve a technical problem as an engineer and you want to have a robot, a legged robot going up the stairs? You want to have it opening doors, carrying your, your package, delivering? That's an engineering task, which is wonderfully solved now with these robots. Or do we want to try to, to find um, a model, an explanation, a proof of concept of what we observe in in nature and can we actually have this proof of concept in a hardware robot which creates an often a bio inspired robot that's a good point maybe since it goes down to have a few questions the first one based on that when you look for the end goal that we design machine that may be similar exactly what we see for example on the ground bird here where do you see the advancement will be for example robotics if we speak do you imagine it would be more interesting design morphology or actuation or material and also for monica what would be that if you really unveil the secret behind what's happening in in these animals or the ground bird what would be that would be other possibilities in robotics if we have exactly what is we see in the ground bird where the advancement will looks like I think there's some important advances to be made in balance control. There's some interesting uh, sensing mechanisms that we're investigating and there's all that could be important for balance control. Um, localized sensing um, in the spinal cord of birds, for example. Um, but as well as that coordinating with the sensing mechanisms, I think the foot structure plays an important role in balance control as well and enabling effective motion in three dimensions. BirdBot is not currently able to do fully 3D turning locomotion because it doesn't have actuators that can abduct and adduct the leg. So the advances might come in determining how to effectively couple uh, intrinsic mechanics and sensing for effective balance control for three-dimensional locomotion. Yeah, the uh, the uh, feet, absolutely. Um, like bird feet are some of the most fascinating things. If you really look at them, if you go out in the park and or in the zoo and you just start looking at bird feet, you will be surprised that none is like the other. There's so many specializations, adaptations. They change in segment length. They have webbing. They they have different, uh, like the way they, they, they thin out towards the end. Just the number of, of toes, uh, you, you see like the, the ratio of those ones to, uh, for, for the entire bird. And we do know that uh, smaller, like birds do different things. Uh, many of the smaller birds perch. Um, we, we don't see an ostrich perching, but uh, we, we, see, we see relatively large birds can also perch. They can sleep on trees. Uh, so they have a specialized function where we do know that um, they can fall asleep doing that. And then we, and that that I, I strongly suspect there is there's a there's a lot of functionality in the feed which allows to have uh, specialized uh, tasks um, being taken over by by foot and leg structures. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really good point. Yeah, maybe for Monica, if there is any example of animal still for you mysterious and locomotion, but still really not very well understood. Yeah, there's, <laughs> where do I start? <laughs> um, we, 
are really only scratching the surface of understanding locomotion at this point. We have um, implemented BirdBot is a, able to do steady gates in a straight line on a treadmill, right? And it demonstrates some of the essential features that we've identified in animals, which is um, following a mass spring-like dynamics and storing elastic energy um, in the leg during stance. But we still have very little understanding about how animals integrate mechanics and control for maneuverability in complex terrains. And we have, some, we have lots of pieces of evidence at different levels of our of understanding, right? We have information about the sensors. We have information about muscle tendon organs and bones and skeletal geometry. Um, we have information about the brain and the spinal cord and its functions, but what we still don't understand is how these are put together effectively to allow agile movement and the control architecture that's really involved in that. We have many hints, but we don't really have a good understanding of that. And until we do, we're not going to be able to recreate the kind of agile, maneuverable locomotion through complex, unstructured terrains that we see, that evidently we see in animals, but still are not quite achieving in freely moving robots. Great, yeah. Uh, for Alexander, uh, maybe what are maybe other left question maybe not answered when it comes to legged robots community or robotics in general? You still, this is really a question for thought. Yeah, still we have to consider this question. Do you have any other question do you think still should be considered? Or maybe trade-offs that sometimes in design, sometimes there are trade-offs when you speak about the design, the trade-off of uh, something, yeah, still not solved it or question not touched yet. Yeah, uh, like like Monica there, it's, it's endless. Every time we try to solve something and we, we think we, we found some kind of an explanation, we typically end up with 10, 10 more very fundamental questions, which is exciting. That's exactly what we're looking for. Um, and um, that clearly also in Leggett Robotics, uh, this very much like in the questions for animals, this concerns the, the hierarchy and the scaling of control and how control interacts with the body, with the, with the robot body. Um, we, in, in robots, we have a somewhat limited number of sensors typically. So we have uh, joint sensors and we have pressure sensors and torque sensors and the and maybe an accelerometer. And if you look at that number and if you look at how much data is flowing into your processor, it's it's it can be more. It becomes every year it becomes more. We get better sensor, uh, higher resolution, faster sampling rate, and so on. And on the other side, in animals, what we know is we have just like 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 multitude more sensors. It's just like we we know they're they're all over distributed. They're not as selectively placed as we have that in robots right now or also in soft robots. And instead there, and, and we use these as animals, we use these sensors for lifelong learning, um, for adaptation. So they, they make us adaptive and they make us uh, evolutionary successful. And uh, that's, that's clearly some, something which we want to achieve at some point in robotics. But dealing with that amount of information, that is clearly a challenge. And also inserting the right sensing type, just having those sensors available, like large strain sensors and soft robotics or so, it, that's, a, that's a big field for good reasons. But even if, let's assume we would have an equivalent of the sensor range and types, what we see in animals, you wouldn't know immediately how, what, what to do with that, right? So you want to make a decision, you want to have the all centrally um, recorded which requires ginormous computational power. I'm clearly not when I'm when I'm walking around. I'm clearly not thinking about exactly how to how much force each of my muscles is receiving and trying to coordinate and like all of the individual muscle fibers. We have strong hierarchies, and the only command which I'm giving, which I'm thinking about, I want to run faster. I want to go left and right. Maybe I tilt a little bit my my upper body. And that's the level of con of control which I typically give, like face information, a very, very high level. And at the same time, I know that all over my body, every, like every sensor is firing 
And we, we're just far, far away from that in, in robotics, right? So we often, the model-based controllers nowadays are using direct information from the sensors and they saying, okay, I am implemented somewhere. Um, but hierarchies, like the deciding hierarchies, um, deciding where and which type of sensors actually needed is very unclear and that relates to also what monica was saying like um there are in not like novel unknown un, 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 uncharacterized sensors in animals existing like the uh, like a sensor and accelerometer maybe in the spinal cord of birds and they might actually also help to solve things in, in robotics and again it's what what kind of information comes out how is it being processed how is it being used uh, is it integrated directly into brain functions or is it uh, indirectly used that's a that's a very large field of research. Yeah, that's excellent. Maybe the last question: What makes you, yeah, for each of you can answer the question, fulfilled in what you're doing, and also aspiration in your lifetime to answer these questions or and the passion for doing what you're doing. So, what makes you fulfilled, fulfilled, and also aspiration in what you're doing? I think I'm a fundamentally curious person who likes to solve problems. So what drives me scientifically is some level of innate curiosity and in wanting to, to discover how things work. But I do find it very fulfilling to use that information to collaborate with colleagues who can then use this to develop new technologies or to inform uh, rehabilitation of mobility in humans or to inform prosthetic uh, designs. So I think movement in animals is a fundamental biological function and activity and movement is essential for our well-being and health. So I feel that, that developing those fundamental principles and that fundamental understanding has wide-reaching applications that can help the general public just by understanding the importance of their own motions and maintaining healthy movement, but also lots of uh, more applied fields who can take a more mm. principled approach to developing tools to rehabilitate people. So I think that that's what gives me the fulfillment is to see, to see the applications of the knowledge. Um, yeah, so, so I, like like some especially this research project here for example and, and the bird bird project was um extremely interesting for me to observe to to for for myself to make a direct bridge between the observation in the animal and being able to replicate this so much that i that, like that we could see the performance of the robot and as we discussed before this is clearly related also to evolution like to form and morphology and therefore to mechanisms and to be able to decipher that in a way, this this was very fulfilling. Uh, to give you here one example, uh, and I was very was yeah, it was just that. Um, and of course, what comes now is the ability to transfer this technology into supporting human life, everyday human life, ideally. Um, that's where the engineer in me says that that would be fantastic. How can we make that? Um, we have tons of problems in our in uh, society, and um, I, I believe having more, like legs on the ground and, and being able to uh, assert forces and, and carry around tools and uh, to do that uh, or directly integrate this into prosthesis and, and exoskeletons equally uh, can make a big difference. And I'm looking forward. I, I'm, I'm really hoping this, this will, be, will be integrated and this will make a difference. And if that's the case, I would be very happy. Yeah. Wonderful. So I don't know if you have any final words yeah, I would like to say for closing. Any final words, like say? Uh, one one short point. So so for the for the for the listeners of your podcast, um, our our cut designs is free access, so you can go onto our web page and you find a link to our admin server, so you can uh, directly access the the cut files, and so you can replicate Birdbot if you want, or just the leg, and you can integrate it into your into your system, and so please do so and let us know. I'll put the um, link here. Just uh, yeah. That's yeah, awesome is, for you. This, that would be great. 